So, Michael, thank you very much for coming in today. Uh, so, how are things going in the economy generally from your perspective in, in Asia and for the, from the perspective of an investor? Look, I mean, asset markets are, again, at, uh, in, multi, in many markets at often record highs. It seems that sort of that all that quantitative easing we have seen is, is stabilized global markets. Now, I think the, the key focus shifts more into into politics, geopolitics, and also that sort of the wealth dispersion. I mean, that sort of move in populism actually has shown that some people actually are unhappy about globalization and increasingly might challenge sort of the construct of the last 40, 50 years, which is also why there's increasingly a lot of interest in alternative economic models, alternative currencies, and, and that brings us to cryptocurrencies and, uh, and also Bitcoin for that matter. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, as, a, as, a, as a casual observer yeah. of things like Bitcoin, uh, well, I've seen the prices go literally through the roof, so it's becoming more valuable than even the, the, the price of gold currently. Yeah, look, I mean, it's maybe it's still a market that is sort of under researched and potentially misunderstood. But I think it's important to make a distinction between Bitcoin, the currency and Bitcoin, the blockchain protocol, right. and both are interlinked. And I think the most important thing is that this is still potentially early days. And I think it's important to remember that this was invented, created by by a network effect in 2009 when the world was very much looking for an alternative, when you couldn't really trust the financial system. With trillions of quantitative easing, the financial system has been put, put back together. But again, maybe the too big to fail issue is now even more important. It's maybe even bigger now. I mean, the potentially central banks could have balance sheet problems in the future. And uh, the verdict is still out on that. I think the key point about Bitcoin is that it's a decentralized distributed trust. Right. distributed consensus that to some extent is like the internet is not controlled by anyone it's not controlled doesn't belong to any country it doesn't belong to any corporation or to any person and and that potentially is a growing trend that trend towards decentralization that's very interesting so would you say that uh, cryptocurrencies are becoming a new assets class it looks like it's becoming a new asset class and it's again like emerging markets 20 30 years ago or frontier markets even 10 20 years ago it starts out in in in, in on the fringes and then later on potentially moves uh, into the mainstream i mean the returns on bitcoin were phenomenal it's actually life-changing returns but it's still very much in the realm of sort of the tech community and, and people sort of who are who are early adopters. The mainstream hasn't really gotten gotten interested in this yet because of the beliefs that it's highly volatile. But then if you put that volatility in perspective, it tends to be upside volatility. Right. And, and that needs to be put in, in perspective. Absolutely. So um, what do you think is driving this increase in growth we've seen this year? 170 percent right. of Bitcoin or even 2,400% for Ether. Uh, Ether. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, last year, I mean, 2016, Bitcoin year on year went roughly up 120% against the United States dollar. This year, it's another 170%. Look, I think the biggest driver is the sort of simple mathematics. And what I mean by that, if you think about it, nation state currencies, whether it's the Nigerian Naira, United States dollar, even the Euro, to some extent, like British pound for that matter has, limited borders and unlimited supply. Bitcoin, on the other hand, has unlimited borders and limited supply. In the sense that with Bitcoin and the Bitcoin protocol, monetary policy is very clear. There's 21 million Bitcoin hardwired into the, into the code. With the Federal Reserve or even the ECB, you never really know what they're going to do in two months with their money supply. Right. And this debate about populism in Europe as well is negative interest rate policy in Europe, did it lead to more populism? Did it lead to increasingly wealth disparity? And that's, that's I suppose, increasing the social issue. Right. And, and also Bitcoin needs to be seen in this, in this context of the social contract. In some societies, even in the United States, there's a social contract being broken. And Mr. Trump made that a, a election campaign pledge that he would like to reform that, but is it really happening? Because some of these globalization technology trends, they're actually beyond politics. And that's why it's so difficult to deal with it. Right, absolutely. And driven by 
you know, the increasing you know, generation Y, generation Z. Yes. They want to use the phone. They want to use things that make life much easier for them to do Correct. transactions uh, rather than go back to get a loan using new technologies. So within that technology is, is blockchain. Correct. So what is the, um, you know, the debate by the, you know, the traditional banks on, you know, they're saying bit of the blockchain technology, but not Bitcoin. Yeah, the, that's a very interesting point, and I think it comes back to this debate in 1994, 1995, when a lot of people had the same arguments about the internet. Who controls the internet? Or we cannot control the internet. Who really regulates the internet, right? And there, basically, a lot of people thought, we don't like the internet, but we like the intranet, right? Of course, l later on, it was proven that an intranet is, to some extent, a very limiting idea. And the same can be said here, sort of a blockchain without a without the trusted token like Bitcoin or Ether, for the Ether and blockchain would be nothing else but a shared database. Right. And I think this is why, to some extent, the banks are sort of in a difficult position because I mean, and technologist and founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates, I think he said it best when he opined that, look, banking is a function is necessary, banks are not. And I think that's the dilemma that the banks are now facing, that to some extent their cost structure is very high, revenue streams are going down and increasingly a lot of that new technology especially the blockchain is fundamentally disrupting their core business right as mr gates was saying the founder of microsoft look banking as a function is necessary banks are not because in old banking everything is centralized in bitcoin it's completely decentralized and you and i become the bank and also more importantly in bitcoin your bitcoin is your asset is nobody else's liability so the bigger picture that needs to be taken into consideration is this this question of fractional reserve bank system with unlimited money supply. Whereas in Bitcoin, you have limited money supply and it's basically an asset-based economic system. It's not a debt finance system. Sure. And the question we now facing in the world is whether the debt has gotten too much that is actually slowing down economic growth. Right, right. And with all its negative side effects. So that's really the debate among politicians, governments, and technocrats. That is, it may be worth you know, every investor considering in their, their white portfolios mm. to consider buying at least one, one Bitcoin. Um, we've seen how the prices have rocketed this year. If there is a chance of the you know, Bitcoins mm. being limited in supply, but become increasingly used in demand and the, right. the valuation increases over time, um, is that good investment advice that every investor should consider buying at least one Bitcoin? Yeah, I would agree with that for two reasons. Number one is that anyways, you always need to diversify. You need to increasingly also diversify forward and that is embrace future possibilities, right? Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But it's more important to, to think in terms of Bitcoin like people think about gold. People are so fixated about the price of Bitcoin in US dollar terms but if you think to, if you speak to people in the gold market, whether it's central banks or, or long-term investors in gold, they don't actually measure gold in the price of US dollars, they measure gold in terms of weight. How many tons of gold do you own, right? This, the Bank of England never really prices it in dollars either. They say, look, we own X amount of tons of gold. Bitcoin should be the same. How many Bitcoins do you own? And think about that potential upside versus the downside. Look, currently at $2,382, the most you can lose is $2,380. In the worst case scenario, in the best scenario, Bitcoin could potentially go to $250,000, even a million dollars. That could be one of the best risk reward ratios in the history of financial markets. And yes, you should have had some exposure. I mean, critics and skeptics of Bitcoin always point out that volatility is very high. Yes, but it's, it's volatility to the upside. And with that sort of volatility, you actually get paid to take that risk in the sense that the potential upside compensates much more than the potential downside. And anybody who has done that actually did well so far. And don't forget, it was still early days. Nice. And if you think about it, many people are unaware of this, but in the currency world, and even if you include all other asset classes, it has been the best performing asset class for a few years. And that trend, I think, is very strong and potentially will Will only uh, will only get more traction. So yes, I, I think the best investment one could make, in my opinion, is education. 
educate yourself about the technology, try to understand Bitcoin and blockchain technology more deeply, because I think the biggest risk is actually, I, I, number one, ignorance, and secondly, half-truth. For example, in the media, there's a lot of sensational headlines talking about some of these returns without actually really looking behind the headlines and trying to understand what's really driving it. And just to summarize again, that point that, look, many nation state currencies have unlimited supply and limited borders. Bitcoin, by definition, has limited supply and unlimited borders, which potentially could be worth more, were worth more in a world that is going into artificial intelligence and robotics. If you have a robot, would you prefer Zimbabwean dollars, United States dollars, British pounds? Maybe cryptocurrencies might be the the preferable option of the future. And again, it it's, doesn't belong to any nation. I think that's also an, adv an, an advantage when, look, in the old days, people were conditioned to believe in the nation state. You live in one country, you have all your money in that currency, but increasingly many companies, but also individuals increasingly live in the cloud. Where's your residency? Where's your holdings of your assets? If it's increasingly a cloud-based system, it fundamentally changes the nature of the economy. And of course, it brings up legal questions as well. But increasingly, yes, it is a sort of a global economy that is increasingly based on, on cloud computing. Fantastic. With no borders. The borderless world. Absolutely. And we're all floating around in clouds, right? So um, but it's very, very true. I mean, every you know application in Microsoft is, is on the cloud, you know, on my computer certainly anyway. So uh, when it comes to buying things, you can buy something from anywhere in the world, whether it's yes. China or America, and have it delivered to you. So uh, it's very, very reasonable that this is going to be such a easy to use technology that once the mass market gets a hold of it, yes. that it's, you know, its value should you know, certainly be seen at that particular time. Um, so, uh, the advice then is to go down and see, and see your your investment manager, your wealth manager, your private banker, and you know consider putting Bitcoin into your portfolio. Yeah, or at least start with educating yourself, yeah. yourself about the potential impact of that technology and how disruptive it could be. If you remember Bill Gates, right? Again, to requote him, he said, "Look, banking as a function is necessary. Banks are not." And I think even the share price market has shown us that there's some truth in that. If you look at the share price of Deutsche Bank, if you look at the share price of Royal Bank of Scotland, many, many old established institutions have actually fallen by the wayside. And I think what could happen with Bitcoin is similar to, to what we saw about Nokia or even uh, BlackBerry, right? BlackBerry was considered to be a market leader and they felt that iPhone, Apple would never be real competition. even. Steve Ballmer from Microsoft said, look, he, in his opinion, Apple iPhones didn't potentially get much market share. That is the same argument that now a bank, a lot of banks and institutions make about Bitcoin as, as a side effect and not to worry about it. And it's too small, it's too volatile, it's often used for the wrong reasons. All these reasons might be valid, but I think the disruptive potential is definitely there. Right. So I think at least uh, become more aware about this, the subject try to understand the deeper implications of blockchain technology and how it not just only changes companies, but also potentially could change government and how government is done. Yes. So again, in government, blockchain and Bitcoin is actually increasingly leading to this concept of government as a service. And that is also a revolutionary idea because many people are just stuck sometimes in the wrong governments, right? In totalitarian states. But with that new technology, a lot of people have choices. So increasingly, we might actually see governments competing for people. So this whole idea of government as a service, I mean, Singapore has done this very well. Singapore became one of the most successful economies in the world by being open to the world and having government as a service, that people are willing to come to, to Singapore, create a future here, create businesses here, work in Singapore to contribute to this economy. So Singapore, again, in that sense, is very world leading like Estonia, and I think more and more countries will follow that model. Absolutely. Singapore is certainly a great success story for yeah. such a tiny nation, and yet it's uh, you know one of the wealthiest, if not by head of capita, yes. the wealthiest in the world. Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so certainly, um, you know, message to the audience is 
educate yourself about Bitcoin and blockchain. And actually on the blockchain, do you sense that that black blockchain technology, which can be used for other applications beyond currencies, yes. could become the areas where, uh, you know, if you're going to invest in technology organizations, it should be in this particular space? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a space to follow. And I think it's this, this, this bigger question about how the next stage of evolution could look like. Because I think sort of the first stage of the internet was also increasingly about centralization. For example, Facebook became a very profitable company and, uh, and so forth by actually being centralized. And they monetize your data, right? With the blockchain approach, increasingly the power goes back to the individual. The individual will be able to increasingly monetize their own data and take more control of your, of your real and digital identity. And that potentially is, is, is leading to more economic choices, I mean, more economic freedom. And that, of course, is also intertwined with the sort of development in artificial intelligence. Smart contracts and so forth will potentially changing legal legal structures around the world. Because now with the blockchain, as somebody said, look, you can't bribe a computer. Everything increasingly becomes very transparent. So that increasingly means that a lot of economic activity will be potentially we have better uses of capital going forward. But it's different capital. Increasingly, it is capital that is based into blockchain cryptocurrency tokens, right? Especially if you think about it, that a lot of that capital, for example, in nation state currencies, is invested in potentially questionable government bonds of nations that are highly indebted. I, I think that's the debate, the debate that comes to. And, and the question for investors is, look, could you could you afford to be wrong on this? Supposedly, the blockchain takes really mainstream application. Bitcoin prices could easily be at $250,000 a coin. In that scenario, could you afford not to be in it? When your downside currently is $2,382, the risk-reward ratio is very positive. So again, I think it's more in terms of portfolio construction to have some optionality in that and also be forward-looking with regards to technological change. It'd be interesting to be sat here again in five years and ten years and see where this goes. Certainly, a couple of years ago, I was looking at the price and, and it's on like, the record. Yeah, yes. I was looking at the price and a couple of years ago, like five hundred dollars. Oh, that seems to be a bit overpriced right now, and it's about five times that. So it's like. A, but then I think is the important point. I think it's 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 misleading to think in terms of price. Just yes. to reiterate, look, I mean, you could have had gold at the end of the Second World War, at the age of the Romans and you still have the same gold. The price you quoted it against in other currencies are, a lot of these currencies don't exist anymore, right? But gold in terms of weight always maintains its value. And maybe Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, tokens like Ether, you should think about the same. It's not the price it currently has against other nation state currencies. How many Bitcoins do you own? Yeah, it's the real estate that you own. It's what Correct. you, what That's you right. That's right. own, what you have. Especially when you talk about intergeneration, intergenerational wealth. How much are you basically willing to sort of give as, a, as an asset that potentially can withhold technological change? Yeah. Right? And, and just one final point, look, I mean, about the current issue about regulation and, and banks having a view on Bitcoin, if you think about it, in 1993, when the United States Post Office or the Post General, Post uh, Postmaster, right, could have regulated email, they would also had a, a more critical view on email, yeah. because it's fundamentally disruptive to their 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 understanding of the world. And I think we're seeing the same today. So again, the most important thing as an investor is to sort of develop your own critical thinking. And, and think in terms of scenarios. And can you afford not to have any allocation to that? I mean, what I personally remember is India. I remember looking at emerging markets early on, I think 17 years ago. Many banks didn't have a view on emerging markets. Many banks said to you, look, emerging markets like India, Turkey, Brazil, even China, please avoid that because the volatility is very high. These markets can be very volatile more volatile than some Swiss equities or UK equities. Well, that was true, but you got paid to take that volatility. 
because over the next 17 years, emerging markets more than, I think, tripled. Some markets have gone up sevenfold. Some markets like India have gone up, I think, 17, 18 times, where Western equity markets were more or less flat. So in, in hindsight, you could not have afforded to have at least some allocation to emerging markets. It's and very the same argument applies now. The argument saying, well, it's misunderstood, it's under-researched, these countries have bad or sort of more limiting regulation. Yeah, well, it's all true, but that's why the return is there. Fantastic. Well, it certainly seems to be a really good idea that if you have small children right now, going to college in 18 years' time, that maybe a $2,300 investment in one Bitcoin may actually pay for that college education yes. 18 years from now. Yeah, and with that volatility, maybe you can use some of that money to buy books or educational material about about what's really underlying the blockchain technology. Right. Because that question about currency is often too limiting. It is much more than currency. It's a token on the blockchain. It's, it's almost like real estate on the blockchain. And that potentially could be quite valuable, yes.